Uh, and basically, uh, just to give you an idea, the, the, the SGB is located in this place here, which is uh, uphill uh, Trieste. So Trieste is down here. You see the, the harbor, which is uh, this one here. And you are basically along the coast here. So this is the place where we are now. This is the tip of the Adriatic Sea, okay? So basically here is Austria, Slovenia on this side, and down here is Venice. And, uh, and, and, and basically uh, everything as far as SGB is, uh, uh, is concerned started uh, in the late 70s and in, in the 80s. You remember those days uh, were the days when genetic engineering started. In the late 70s, a uh, uh, few people in, uh, uh, in California, mostly Paul Burr, Stanley Cohen, and several other, uh, showed for the first time that you can take a piece of DNA from one organism and transfer it to another organism. And this is uh, the, the, the cut and paste technology that now forms genetic engineering. And so uh, a few companies at that time started to take advantage of this possibility, especially one in Canada, Lilly, uh, uh, took the gene for um, insulin, the human gene for insulin, and transferred it uh, to a microorganism. And since the uh, genetic code is universal, the protein that was produced in the microorganism, in the bacteria, was exactly identical to the human one. And this was the, the first uh, recombinant uh, um, product, so the product, uh, uh, the protein produced through the recombinant DNA that was uh, uh, generated ever, and uh, it, uh, it was introduced in the market in 19, uh, 1982. Now we are very familiar with this kind of technology, but at that time uh, that was uh, absolutely unique. I, I graduated in, uh, in medicine in 1984, and uh, a vast part of uh, our last year of teaching in, uh, in uh, clinical medicine was how to avoid uh, reaction for patients with diabetes to insulin that was purified from cows and, and pigs, because this was uh, the real source. When genetic engineering produced the insulin, this has completely solved the problem. There are now 400 million people taking recombinant insulin. The same for growth hormone. Uh, small children due to an hereditary disorder in the growth hormone gene had to be supplemented with the growth hormone which had to be human in that case and was produced from uh, the uh, pituitary gland, so the small gland from the brain of cadavers. From genetic engineering, people took uh, the growth hormone gene transferred to bacteria and that solved the problem. There are now more than 200 products produced uh, uh, through these uh, technologies. And at that time, you see the dates here when these companies were born, there were large biotech companies that were founded in the United States that became millionaires uh, in, in, very, very rapidly. And uh, people in the United Nations environment started to think and fear that uh, the introduction of these uh, biotechnologies uh, would uh, increase the gap from developed countries, so Europe and the United States and Japan, and the least developed country. And so realized that uh, it was time to set up a center which could do these kind of technologies in favor of the developing countries. And the center where scientists from developing countries uh, could uh, operate in this, uh, in this uh, area. Now things have changed from that time because some, some of, of the countries that supported the birth of ICGB at that time are Brazil, uh, South uh, Africa, or Russia, and, uh, and uh, so on. One can debate uh, uh, which is developed or which is not developed. But this is the history 30 years ago. And so basically there was a first meeting in 1982 organized in Belgrade. Then uh, a discussion started where the center had to to, to be set. There was a foundation meeting in Madrid in 1983. At that time, Italy uh, advanced its candidature to host the center. And uh, at the same time, India did the same. There was a, a period of another year where there was debate. And at the end, there was a conference in Vienna in 1984 that established the ICGB as a, a center with uh, two components, one based in Trieste, where the headquarters also are, and the other one in New Delhi, India, and activity began in 1987. And now ICGB has the, three or the two original components in Trieste and Delhi. In addition, uh, seven years ago, there's been a third one established in Cape Town in South Africa that mo mostly serves the African uh, continent. And there are 64 countries that have signed the statute 
of uh, the center and the operation of the three components of so the laboratories are carried out uh, with uh, the coordination, in coordination with 40 national laboratories that we call affiliated centers in our member states. So basically, uh, uh, just to give you a picture, uh, there are uh, um, uh, now 16 research groups in Trieste, about 200 people. Uh, uh, daily is a double the size in terms of people and four times bigger in, in terms of, uh, uh, of space. Uh, it occupies a big campus in the periphery of, uh, um, of uh, New Delhi. There are 35 research groups. Operation in Cape Town is more. There are four research groups, about, about 50, uh, 50 people. And basically, we do uh, sort of five kind of main things. First, in the ICHB laboratories, we run advanced research. So we want that our research is really uh, top of the class. So we want to compete with the big universities and research centers uh, worldwide. And obviously, if you, if you believe that the metrics for publications is the journal where you publish, uh, well, in the last five years, we have published in all these journals in the laboratories in Trieste and daily mostly. And so basically, we, we strive for uh, excellence in research. But at the, at the same time, we want to do this kind of research uh, at a top level with the scientists coming from our member states. So every year, we give fellowships for PhD students and postdoc to join our uh, laboratories in Delhi, Trieste, and, and uh, uh, Cape Town. Uh, in Trieste, uh, um, we have now 60 um, uh, people uh, supported by CGB fellowships. And here you see the nationality of uh, these uh, uh, scientists. These are all scientists that uh, uh, are awarded a fellowship to conduct their PhD studies or a, a fellowship for their uh, postdoc. And so they come really internationally. There are now, at this moment, more than 25 nationalities represented <clears throat> in the laboratories in, in, in Trieste. The whole fellowship program is named under uh, the name of Professor Arturo Falaschi, who was being uh, uh, the founder and the big motor of the center uh, in, in, in its first uh, uh, 15, 20 years of activity, where the center was founded and it grew lar as large as, uh, as it is now. Uh, every year there is a call for application for, uh, for fellowships. These are the flyers that have been the distributed internationally. It might be that in some of your, your institutions you have seen these, uh, these flyers. This is a flyer for the PhD program, there is a, and this is a flyer for postdoctoral fellowships. There is a, a deadline on the 31st of March for both of the, uh, these uh, uh, programs. Then we organize meeting courses and, uh, and workshops. This is one of the meetings uh, uh, historical meetings organized by ICGB, one of the, the kind of events that uh, uh, are, uh, are very, very dear uh, to us. Uh, there are about uh, 20 of these kind of meetings organized every year so in this kind of format or in the format of a larger meeting with hundreds uh, of uh, uh, participants. Uh, on average, uh, 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 we have a, um, a bit less than 1,000 participants in terms of scientists to our meetings uh, uh, every year. And uh, the purpose of this meeting is to invite as speakers and teachers the top scientists in a given field, but at the same time to facilitate participation of scientists from our member states. So these meetings are, are conceived as a, as a sort of venue where scientists from uh, uh, the, the least developed countries also can have easy access to top scientists in their own uh, specific, uh, specific field. We have organized since 1998 almost 500 of, uh, of, uh, of these events. Uh, Mrs. Lipolis is heading the office uh, uh, that uh, organizes all these courses, so she really has uh, an international uh, experience and capacity in organizing these courses. And uh, since a few years, also, we want to give a bigger audience to this kind of events, because we don't want to invite uh, top speakers uh, to speak uh, only to an audience of few tens of people, but we want this to be uh, enlarged. And so we started recording uh, um, several of these events. I believe that this is one of the, of the events that are recorded. And these recordings are then produced in the form of uh, uh, movies. 
Uh, these are very nice movies where you can see the slides, uh, high resolution, you see the speaker uh, speaking, and these are posted on uh, the iTunes uh, platform. So basically, this is the same platform where you can connect your iPhone, iPad, PC, or Mac, you can download movies in uh, M4V format. And, uh, and so basically, you can watch all our presentations uh, in this format. This has had a, a really a, a tremendous, uh, uh, there are now hundreds of these presentations, uh, in, uh, in uh, iTunes has, has, has had a, a tremendous success. We have had uh, in the last two years and a half more than 350,000 downloads really from all over the world. So we have downloads from Trinidad, Tobago, uh, the, 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 the Virgin Islands and, uh, and other places where you would never think that there is an interest for advanced science, but there is. And so this is also a measure on how science is really, really a, a common denominator for for uh, human activities. Again, there is a call for proposals for organizing meetings and courses. Uh, there is a deadline on the 31st of March this year for those of 2016. So if somebody is interested in organizing a meeting of course in their own country and wants ICGB support, we are happy to provide this uh, through these uh, uh, competitive calls. And also we give grants. So we act as a granting agency from uh, laboratories in our member countries. And uh, again, this has been a very successful uh, program. Uh, these are the countries in which we have funded activity. These are uh, small grants in terms of amount of money. It's around 20,000 euros per year for three years. But this, in several of the countries that support us, this amount of money is sufficient to establish new research activities. And um, an important part of this uh, grant application is that we favor uh, young scientists that want to establish their own, uh, their own um, uh, independent uh, activity after a successful PhD or postdoc abroad. We call these the early career return grants. So if a scientist from one of our member states has been successful in one of the ICGB laboratories, but also in the United States and Europe, and want to go back home seriously to establish their own activity in the country, we support him or her for this kind of activity. Again, this is a competitive call here at the deadline 30th, the 30th of April. And uh, the last activity that we do, the fifth one, is uh, we develop technology that we can uh, negotiate for transfer to uh, companies. Basically, here in, uh, in Trieste, we have a facility for the production of uh, biosimilars. Uh, several of the recombinant gene products that uh, I have shown you at the beginning, starting from insulin and including uh, interferon, erythropoietin, uh, several growth factors, now they are off patent, so they can be sold, they can be produced um, uh, independent of the patent, but several of the countries worldwide still depend on the big pharma companies for their production because they basically they don't have the know-how. So basically we liaise with companies in these states to provide the know-how. There are now 17 countries in the world that have uh, recombinant medicines that are produced thanks to our technologies. So if you are interested in, uh, in our research, uh, you will see uh, uh, the laboratory. I think there will be a visit to the laboratory later in, uh, in the week uh, and here in Trieste. We have a very vibrant environment, uh, working on, uh, mostly on subjects uh, in the biomedical field that include also stem cell research, gene therapy. We speak a bit about this uh, today, and we have a, a, a series of uh, uh, facilities that uh, facilitate this research can be easily accessed by all the scientists being, being here. Okay, this is, uh, uh, as far as the introduction was, uh, was concerned, and basically I will speak uh, uh, twice in this uh, course to you. And uh, today we, I will deal with a specific issue that uh, we, we, we have pioneered and we are carrying on, and, uh, and that concerns uh, technology for gene transfer in vivo. And, uh, and, uh, and later, uh, I, I think tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, we speak to you uh, about uh, one of our most successful research, which is the research to provide cardiac uh, regenerations and the use of uh, small uh, uh, RNAs towards promoting proliferation of uh, cardiac cells with the idea of providing a therapy for people with myocardial infarction of heart failure that you know is a big uh, epidemic condition now. 
So the, the starting point of, of uh, the, the work of my laboratory is very simple, and it relates with the uh, expectations uh, for uh, the, the, the length of life. You know that life expectancy has uh, increased dramatically. A person with, who was born in the ancient uh, Rome had a life expectancy of 22 years. This is a, a number that's severely impacted by the very high perinatal and postnatal infant mortality. But uh, uh, also in the, in the Western countries, the life expectancy was no longer uh, than 50 years, uh, one century ago, in rose to 76 in the 200. And the interesting thing is that uh, now we have uh, um, 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 passed uh, this uh, uh, number. And here in Italy, for example, we are more than 80 years old for males and uh, 85 for females. We are in the seventh and fifth place in the world. And uh, what I find, however, uh, exciting of these uh, numbers is that uh, if you would think uh, of a medicine which cures everything, which there are no infectious diseases, in which uh, there are vaccines to prevent uh, any kind of, uh, of uh, condition, in which there is no cancer, there are no accidents, and everything is repaired, nevertheless, uh, our life expectancy would not be infinite. But uh, as a human, as a species, the human beings are set to live no longer than 120, 125 years. The longest persons uh, um, on the planet recorded to live at the current moment is a Japanese lady who is 117. And, uh, and we don't know why this is that. We don't know why a mouse lives two years, a rat three, a squirrel, uh, I think seven years, a sheep, 12 years, a fly, Drosophila three months, uh, and you, we as human beings uh, will live uh, a maximum of uh, 120 years. What we know, however, is that uh, this is highly related to the incapacity of several of uh, key organs in our body to regenerate and repair the damage that uh, they are subject to during the adult life. Uh, and so basically, there is a progressive exhaustion of the regenerative capacity, and there is a strong correlation between this exhaustion with the uh, life uh, expectancy. For example, uh, if you take a, a, a human or a mouse heart, in this, in this case, or a rat heart, you can recover fantastic cells from the heart. These are called cardiomyocytes. They are very big cells. These are the nuclei. So several times they are binucleated. All these striations are the contratile apparatus, which is perfectly functional. These cells can be kept beating in a culture, but there is no way of having these cells to proliferate. So these cells have exited the capacity of proliferation immediately after birth, and they will never proliferate again. Same for neurons. We are born with about 50 billion neurons. We lose 80,000 neurons every day. We are losing neurons now. Me speaking and you listening to me, we are losing neurons. And uh, there is no way that uh, in the vast part of the brain, especially in the cortex, there is no way that uh, there is replacement of new neurons. There are other, other tissues that keep proliferating during the adult life. For example, the, 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 the bone marrow. Uh, the bone marrow contains stem cells that can generate all circulating cells in the body, so red blood cells, white blood cells, uh, platelets. And uh, at birth, there are about 10,000 stem cells in the humans that can, uh, uh, that which are responsible for all circulating cells, for the renewal of all circulating cells. Some of our uh, um, um, uh, white blood cells, granulocytes, have a life span of few hours, so they need to be completely um, substituted continuously. Well, uh, uh, there was a study a couple of years ago in, uh, in an old lady who died after 110 years in the Netherlands, and people took her bone marrow before, uh, um, before death and measured the number of uh, stem cells that uh, um, were responsible for all circulating cells. Well, she had only two stem cells that were responsible for her circulation. She was perfectly normal. Uh, in terms of a metopoietic system, but that metopoietic system, instead of being some state of 10,000 cells, she had only two uh, remaining there. So basically, we have this exhaustion of our proliferative capacity in several organs. And this is the reason why we are facing a real epidemic of degenerative conditions, because we are increasing our lifespan, but at the same time, our organs cannot regenerate. And now, for example, uh, uh, one person out of three in the world dies 
because of a cardiovascular disorder. I have a friend in the United States who starts his seminar looking at the audience and asking everybody to now look at who sits on your left side or your right side, and you have to decide who of you three will die because of myocardial infarction or stroke, because this is a reality. So basically, all of us are going one out of three of dying because of this uh, condition, 15 million new cases worldwide uh, of heart failure, which is a condition by which uh, the myocardium loses the capacity to pump. In most instances, this is due to the fact that cardiomyocytes are, so the contracted cells are lost, and the remaining myocardium doesn't have the power to contract properly. 15 new million cases diagnosed every year. 80% of these cases are not in Europe or in the United States, bar, but are, according to the WHO, in low and middle income countries. So a real epidemic of cardiovascular disorders. If you look at the numbers uh, uh, for uh, dementias, in Europe, 30 people after 80 years develop Alzheimer's disease. Uh, if you look at the numbers uh, for uh, uh, um, uh, age-related macular degeneration, which is a degenerative condition of the retina, uh, one person out of three after 75 doesn't see well because they have degeneration of the retina. One person out of two, out of two uh, uh, after 75 years uh, doesn't hear well because they have lost their neuroepithelial cells or the inner ear. And so all what these conditions have in common is that they are due to the loss of critical cells in our body, and the body has not the capacity to replenish for these cells. So a tremendous problem of degeneration and lack of uh, regeneration. So it is in this setting that uh, a few years ago we discovered that there is a class of viral vectors, or small viruses, that are fantastic in transferring genes exactly in the same cells that undergo degeneration. And uh, these vectors are based on a virus which is called AAV. Uh, AAV stands for adeno-associated virus. It has nothing to do with adenovirus. Uh, uh, simply it's what discovered more than 40 years ago is a contaminating particle, uh, contaminating uh, cells that were also infected with adenovirus. And it belongs to a completely different family. The family is that of parvoviruses. These are small viruses. When I speak in front of uh, biotechnology, you, or, uh, nanotechnology audiences, I describe this uh, as the perfect nanobiotechnology particles, so 20 nanometers in diameter, and only 60 proteins that form a coat that contain a single-stranded RNA of 5 KB. So it's a very tiny particle. Uh, it contains only two genes, rep and cap, and this can be completely substituted by, uh, a, a, by genetic engineering by a cassette that contains a promoter, a gene of interest, and a polydenylation site. 85% uh, of us have antibodies against the EAV, so it means that all of us come in contact with this virus during our adolescence or our infancy, but there is no disease associated. So it's a virus that is very diffuse in the population, but never associated with the disease. Well, uh, there is a, it is very easy to produce uh, vectors from AAV. So basically, you take a plasmid that contains the construct, like the one I have just described to you. Another plasmid that contains the rep and cap genes, some genes from adenovirus, you transfect these two simply in cell culture, in a, a, a susceptible cell line. This cell line, in this cell line, the virus will replicate. Each cell will produce 10 to the 5, 10 to the 4 particles, which eventually will lyse the cells. And then you can take this, purify by simple biochemical means. You can have pure preparations. Well, if you take this preparation of virus, of vector, and you use them to uh, um, uh, transfer genes into cultured cells in the laboratory, it is the worst vector you can ever use. So never use an AV vector if you want to transfer gene in fibroblast, epithelial cells, uh, keratinocytes, uh, endothelial cells, cancer cell lines, so everything can grow in culture. However, if you take the same vectors and you inject them directly in vivo in an animal, you will see that the vector will be extremely successful in transferring genes in cells like muscle fibers in the skeletal muscle or in the heart, but in cardiomyocytes, not fibroblasts, not endothelial cells, 
in the brain, in neurons, but not glial cells, or in the retina, basically in all cells, so the photoreceptor, all the retina pigment epithelium cells, and the ganglionar cells. And there are some small variations of the 60 protein that form a coat that also allows the vector to be injected systemically, IP or IV. This vector travels in the circulation and will end up in the heart, in the muscle. What these cell types have in common is that they are post-mitotic cells. So cells that have exited the cell cycle and will never re-enter the cell cycle for their entire life. So basically, if you take a, 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 an endothelial cell, an endothelial cell in normal conditions is estimated to divide every six months. But in principle, it is a cell that has the capacity to divide. And if you put them in culture, an endothelial cell in culture, it divides if you add growth factor. Well, this cell is not targeted by AV. But if you take a cardiomyocyte or a neuron, which will never divide, and also you put it in culture, it will never divide, well, this is a fantastic target for AV. There is a very fascinating biology behind this. If you are interested, we can speak about this later. This is nothing to do with the receptor, but it is due to the way the incoming AV vectors are treated by the cells. So the vector in comes into the cells. If the cells are post-mitotic, the single strand is converted to a double strand, and the genes are expressed. If the cell has the capacity to replicate, it has some proteins that try to uh, rearrange the viral genome, repair the viral genome, and this inactivates completely the virus. If you want, we can discuss this later. You see here, however, that the viruses, the vectors are very efficient. These are IP or IV injections of a vector that expresses a fluorescent protein, and this is the heart after uh, three months, and you see that there is a fantastic transduction of cardiomyocytes in vivo. So in Trieste, we have set up a facility uh, more than 10 years ago for the production of these vectors. We have uh, uh, started using these really in collaboration with a number of laboratories here in Europe, or also in the United States, Japan, Korea. And, and the idea we, we, we use these vectors and our collaborators use these vectors, it is uh, that uh, uh, they provide really a fantastic tool for gene transfer in vivo in these specific tissues. And so they allow one to uh, answer a very simple question. So if you are working on a gene and you want to know what the gene does in vivo, well, what you do traditionally is uh, to construct a transgenic mouse that overexpresses this gene into your specific tissue and uh, in, uh, in the adult. So for example, if you want to know whether your gene X what is the function of gene X in the heart in an adult mouse, you uh, do a transgenic for the gene X in which uh, you're capable of activating expression of gene X through a genetic trick only in adult cells, for example, through after the using the tetracycline inducible promoters or other tricks. Well, if you are very good, this will take you months of work. Uh, instead, you can have exactly the same answers answer simply by constructing a vector and in 10 days you can inject your mouse and see what happens of your, um, of your heart. And you can combine two, three, four vectors simultaneously because these vectors have the capacity to induce a very high multiplicity of infection. So you, have, you can see the phenotype also of a complex cocktails of different vectors. So basically, we have uh, played a lot around using these vectors as tool for phenotypic analysis. And you don't, uh, uh, you are not bound to deliver uh, protein coding cDNAs because you can simply uh, inhibit genes by expressing a short herping RNA against a specific messenger RNA, and you do, you also mimic somehow the down regulation, if not the know-how. So basically, the story I want to tell you. And now is, is a, a story that uh, we find very exciting that is, um, has been developing in the laboratory over the last three years or so. And it is a story that started with the idea of saying, well, you, we have a lot of degenerative conditions. We have vectors that go very well to the cells that degenerate. Okay, how can we find some, some factors that provide benefit to these cells? Obviously, uh, uh, if you have this kind of question, basically you have a, a number of options. So for example, 
you can you can do say okay the problem is that we have the vector we don't have the gene so how can we find the gene well what we would do conventionally would be for example to take uh, suppose you are interested in the heart you have a heart a normal heart and a heart with heart failure so a degenerated heart so basically traditionally what we would do uh, would be to, is to ask uh, what are the genes that are expressed in the normal heart what are the genes that are expressed in the diseased heart you find some difference and then uh, you study, you say, okay, this gene is differentially expressed, so it is expressed only in the normal heart, not in the diseased heart, so you study what is biochemical function, which are the interactions, you do a lot of biochemistry. And then uh, you say, uh, okay, let's see if uh, I express the gene in the diseased heart, uh, if it does good. And you do this in the fifth or sixth uh, uh, figure of your paper, you find and report that your gene, once put in the heart, does good to the heart. People have done this over the last 20 years. There is not one single therapeutics that have reached clinical application. This biochemist-driven approach is very powerful because you dissect biochemistry, but not necessarily, and it's very unlikely instead, that you find really something that can be used for, uh, for therapy. Then uh, uh, another, another possibility is uh, to do what I call the photographer approach. So this is a, a sort of biochemistry that has been brought uh, to a, another level of complexity when uh, uh, first microarrays and then uh, RNA sequencing uh, started to be available to all laboratories. So basically, you take your uh, normal heart, you take your heart failure heart, and then uh, you do RNA sequencing of all the transcript, and you find a, com a series of transcripts that goes up, and a series of transcripts that goes down, and then you find yourself in the trouble that uh, you don't understand anything, basically. You have to resort to bioinformatics, you have long lists in Excel files, and uh, all the laboratories that do, do this, in including ours, we are always fighting with these huge Excel files, which eventually we try to find out what might be interesting, and we go back to the previous approach of the photographer, uh, uh, to, the, to the, 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 the biochemist approach. But if you think of at what made biology to make big jumps in discoveries in, in the history of molecular biology, was not uh, the biochemist approach but was the functional approach, a functional screening. For example, how were oncogenes discovered? The oncogenes were discovered because uh, in, uh, in the early 80s, uh, people plated uh, um, fibroblasts of mouse origin, 3T3 cells. And the fibroblasts, in the absence of serum, they undergo confluence, or even the presence of serum, they go confluence, they stop dividing. So basically, then people took uh, DNA from tumors and transfected these uh, 3T3 cells with DNA from tumors. And after a while, there were some foci of cells that restarted proliferating. So they analyzed at the time by southern blotting what was there inside. And they discovered that there were some mutated or hyperactivated genes that gave, imparted the cells the capacity to proliferate. This was the discovery of the uh, oncogenes. So functional approach, screen for function as a first approach. This is the way, for example, several receptor for animal viruses were discovered. Uh, think at HIV. HIV was, uh, was discovered in, uh, in 1982, 1983, first sequence 1982, I think. And, and basically, it was immediately clear that the virus had to use the CD4 receptor to enter into the target cells because uh, th that was uh, inferred from clinical data because people with immunodeficiency had uh, a progressive decrease in CD4 cells. So it was very obvious that the CD4 was the receptor that allowed the virus to enter into CD4 positive lymphocytes and macrophages. People did a very simple experiment immediately. They took uh, HeLa cells, they transferred the CD4 receptor gene, so this cell became CD4 positive. They tried to infect these cells with HIV complete failure, the virus didn't enter. And that was done uh, in the mid 80s, and everybody knew that uh, there must be another receptor. And the receptor remained completely elusive until uh, 10 years later. A couple of laboratories did a very simple experiment. They took uh, cDNAs from CD4 positive lymphocytes, transfected HeLa cells that were CD4 positive, and they found clones that at that point became susceptible to HIV infection. They looked which cDNAs were responsible for this, and this is the way the core receptor for HIV infection, so the chemokine receptors, 
were discovered, CCR4 and CCR5. So chemical functional screening, same for protein interaction, for same even for small uh, molecules. I mean, small molecules that are several of the small molecules that are now in uh, uh, clinical use, especially for uh, targeted therapy of tumors, were discovered by screening functionally um, uh, libraries of uh, 100,000 compounds for compounds that might uh, inhibit uh, a specific enzyme. And so basically our question was, uh, uh, can we use a V-vector to do a functional screening? So in, in, instead of transferring one gene at a time, can we use this uh, for a functional screening? And basically uh, we develop a method that we call FANCEL, which is uh, basically like this. So we have a collection of uh, um, AV vectors. Suppose that uh, there is one factor of the beneficial, which is here in red. So basically uh, this is one out of uh, uh, several hundreds. We, out of this plasma, we produce a batch of virions, and uh, this batch of virions is transferred into the heart. And basically here, each uh, vector will go to a different cardiomyocyte. And, uh, and then uh, after a while, uh, a few weeks, uh, we induce uh, damage in that organ. If you are interested in the heart, we ligate the coronary artery. If we inject the vectors in the pancreas, we induce diabetes. If we inject the vector in the retina, we induce retinal degeneration. We wait a few more weeks, and then we recover the vector, or uh, we simply do a PCR for a particular sequence that each vector has, which is a 10-nucleotide degenerate sequence with a specific nucleotide sequence that defines exactly that vector, so what is called a barcode. So we do a PCR for the barcode, we do next generation sequencing for the barcode, and basically what we do is we measure the frequency of each vector here, and the frequency of each vector in input. If there is some factors that, have, that are enriched, it means that there was a selective advantage exerted by selective pressure. Or what we can do is also clone the insert, produce another batch, and repeat the cycle of selection two, three, four times. It's like selecting for antibiotic resistance in HeLa cells, so G418 resistant in HeLa cells, with the exception that here we do this in vivo. There is no other way of doing this in vivo in this kind of tissues, except using uh, AV vectors. So basically we had uh, uh, support from the um, uh, European Research Council to do this kind of, uh, of uh, work, and we constructed two big uh, uh, libraries, well, big, uh, sorry, two libraries in AV vector. One corresponds to the mouse secretome. So basically we scan the whole genome, search for genes that have a, a, a signal peptide that don't have a transmembrane portion, so these are putatively uh, secreted proteins, we cloned one by one. And the other one is a collection of 800 uh, precursor gene, um, genes for microRNAs. And uh, we started screening. So the first screening that we did was in the pancreas. So basically, we injected uh, pools of 50 vectors in the pancreas. Then you induce uh, the generation of the pancreas with uh, this drug here, streptozotocin. Basically, this kills beta cells. If some cells survive, uh, it means that uh, the factor they contain is beneficial. And uh, uh, just to give you an idea of how the results work, these are results of 1,100 mouse cDNAs coding for the mouse secretome. Uh, where you look at C1, it means that the frequency before selection and after selection is uh, identical, so there is no, no positive results. If it is above this line, the factors are selected. If below this line, these factors are detrimental. And you see immediately that there are several factors that are clearly selected, and uh, most of these factors are, have never been described in type 1 diabetes, so they are completely new potential biotherapeutics. One of the factors instead is a prolactin. Prolactin is described in the literature as a protective factor for beta cells. Lactating mothers, when mothers with diabetes lactate, give milk to their babies, they are protected from diabetes progression because they have high levels of prolactin and prolactin protect. So this was a fortuitous control that we found in our screening. Again, in the, these uh, um, factors here, there are several that have never been described, but there is again another prolactin. There is cholecystokinin, which is currently used for type 1 diabetes. And, uh, and so we are very excited. Now we are testing one by one these factors to see if we can find new biotherapeutics against, uh, against uh, uh, degeneration. Another approach that we did with our library, we collected uh, uh, um, 100 cDNAs uh, from our collection, 
um, representative of different categories of secreted proteins. Ah, why we do secreted proteins? Because uh, we could have done this with transcription factors, but if we did this with transcription factors, suppose we found we find a transcription factor that is beneficial, then we are bound to use gene therapy to transfer the gene for this transcription factor. Instead, if we do secreted factors, then we can uh, obtain the recombinant proteins and use the recombinant proteins to do the work. So basically, we, we, we had a collection of hormones and growth factors, chemicals, interleukins, secreting data. You can read that, including several clones that of an unknown function. This time, we were interested in screening for factors protecting the heart and the skeletal muscle against acute ischemia. So basically, we injected these uh, pools of um, these uh, 100 into the skeletal muscle, then ligated the femoral artery, and selected what comes out. This is, was a very visual screening. So these are 100 factors with a PCR, uh, with primers flanking the insert. So each band is a collection of different cDNAs. So you see this ladder here. And these are the same viral preparation. This is a viral preparation. This is a viral preparation uh, three weeks after it has been injected in a series of mice. Here, two mice are shown. Uh, injection was in the both legs, but resection of the femoral artery was only in one leg. So the other leg serves as a control in each animal. So basically, you have to compare the uh, ischemic leg with the non-ischemic leg in these two mice, I compare this with the input vectors. And if you look at the ladder by eye, you don't see much. So we took all this material and recloned this into AV vector, did the second round of selection. This time, uh, something comes out. You see that this band is stronger here and here compared it was here. We recloned everything, did the third round of selection. And this time, the band becomes really very, very big. We were very excited. We cut out the band from, from the gel, sequenced it. And it turned out uh, to be ghrelin. Does anybody of you know what ghrelin is? Except Andres, <laughs> Fabiola. <laughs> well, I didn't know at the time. I didn't know. It was uh, put in our uh, list of, of factors. And it, if, if, I confess I, 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 I didn't know. So I went to the literature. And basically, the story is this one. Uh, ghrelin is a, a, a hormone, a neurohormone. So it's a peptide hormone. Uh, discovered in 1999, 28 amino acids, uh, that is produced by the stomach in condition of starvation. And uh, it, it, it signals to the um, uh, hypothalamus to uh, activate the secretion of growth hormone and to the rest of the brain to adopt a food searching behavior. So the reason why we search for food when we are hungry, it is because our empty stomach releases ghrelin, which activates our brain. So it's a neuroendocrine peptide uh, signaler. Now, you will ask me, what, what's the relationship between this and the fact that we have selected this against ischemia? Well, it is a, an extremely powerful protective agent against acute ischemia. These are uh, hearts that were injected with uh, uh, AV9 ghrelin uh, immediately after ligation of the coronary artery. So after ligation of the coronary artery, you produce a big infarct. And this infarct compromises the capacity of the heart to pump. You see, uh, you can measure this capacity of pumping through this parameter, which is left ventricular ejection fraction, which is uh, the percentage of, of blood which is pumped out every heartbeat. It's uh, around, normally around 70 75%. After myocardial infarction, it goes to less than 60 And then over time, uh, progressively in three months, it goes very, very low. And uh, these are mice experiments, so it has it reached uh, 30%. Below this, uh, you would need a heart transplantation to survive. However, if you give AV9 ghrelin, then you see a superb protection for this heart failure. And these are all other parameters at the end of the experiment. If you look at the size of the infarts with a ghrelin, these are very much uh, reduced. We, we wonder why this happened, so why we selected ghrelin as an anti-ischemic factor. And the reason uh, that, that we discovered that this is a very powerful agent inducing autophagy in the heart and in the skeletal muscle. Autophagy is a mechanism by which the heart, in this case, so the cells, uh, digest a vast part of their cellular content to renew organelles and other, in, in, in other structures inside the cytoplasm without getting rid of the nucleus. 
this is a, I mean, uh, I started by saying that we are born with a certain number of cardiomyces or a certain number of neurons, and we die after more than 80 years with exactly the same cells. So there is no capacity of division all through the life. Well, autophagy is a mechanism by which at least the cytoplasmic content is allowed to evolve and to rejuvenate over time. And in fact, if you give ghrelin to um, skeletal muscle or to the myocardium after uh, acute ischemia, you induce transcription of the genes involved in autophagy. And uh, you activate specifically autophagy. This is a Western blotting uh, looking for this protein here, which is a, a main protein that involved, is involved in the formation of the autophagic vesicles called LC3. And uh, when you see uh, conversion of this LC3 form from this size to this size here, which is called LC3-2, this is a strong marker of induction of, uh, of autophagy. You see that ghrelin does this job. And uh, a specific form of autophagy, which is very important for the skeletal muscle and the heart, which is shown here, is the capacity of uh, eliminate damaged mitochondria. If you do induce uh, acute ischemia in the heart, you damage the lot, the mitochondria, and these damaged mitochondria are very harmful because instead of burning oxygen they, uh, and produce ATP, they burn oxygen to produce reactive oxygen species, uh, superoxide anion, uh, H2O2, and all uh, the um, chemical agents that come from the reaction of these, and these are very, very damaged. And, uh, and, and so basically the heart wants to, to get rid of these damaged mitochondria, and the grading is a powerful inducer specifically of uh, mitophagy. You see that uh, here you see vesicles that are stained with an antibody against LC3, which is a marker of autophagy, and the mitochondria here are stained with a, with a stain for mitochondria, which is mitotracker. You see a lot of these vesicles, which are yellow, which means that are vesicles that contain mitochondria, which the cell try to get rid of. And at the same time, you see a reduction in H2O2 production and an increase in ATP production. And the ultimate result of this is that basically you decrease the uh, death of the myocardial cells. So if you, if you ligate a coronary artery after two days, you see a lot of cells that undergo apoptosis. Apoptosis here is seen with a staining, which is a tunnel staining for fragmented DNA, which is in red here. See how many red dots you have here. If you give ghrelin, there is a strong protection from apoptosis through this autophagic mechanism. A strong protection of apoptosis <coughs> explains why we have selected expressly this, uh, uh, this factor. I, I, uh, well, I think I'm, I'm, I'm short of time, so I, I could skip here just to show you the last, uh, the last table, so the last slide. So this is just to say that uh, we are now very excited by this possibility of selecting directly genes in vivo in this kind of tissue. So we, we are engaged in a in number of collaborations uh, with uh, friends and collaborators basically uh, worldwide, uh, and apart from myocardial infarction and the pancreas, I'll show you here. Uh, the pancreas work is a collaboration with Fatima Bosch in Barcelona and Philippe Alban in Geneva. Then uh, we have, we select for survival motor neurons. Uh, we, um, Charles Venson and, uh, in uh, Los Angeles, uh, we select uh, for mass regeneration with a group uh, of Terry Arvinen in Tampere and with Jeff Molkent in Cincinnati for genes that uh, uh, protects against muscle, muscle uh, dystrophy. Don't know if we will be able to find some new therapeutics, but certainly the fact that uh, uh, through the screening we are recognizing a large amount of uh, new factors that have never been described uh, as uh, potentially involved in this kind of degenerative processes, uh, processes uh, very exciting to us and certainly will give us to do for the last uh, 10, uh, 10 years or so. Uh, and this was my last slide. And then obviously you will ask yourself the question, well, this probably will be a mean to find genes that protect against degeneration. But what about regeneration? So how can we convince a heart that has lost a portion of the contractile tissue because of an infarction to regenerate or a, or a brain to regenerate? And we don't have an answer for the brain, but perhaps we have an answer for the heart, and this will be the topic of my next, uh, next uh, talk uh, in a couple of days. So thank you very much for your you. attention, and here are some questions. Thank you.